Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural Augusta Baker Lecture at the University of South Carolina. My name is Nicole Cook, and I am the Augusta Baker Endowed Chair at the School of Library and Information Science, uh, which is part of the College of Information and Communications. And so again, welcome so very much to our lecture this evening. So our lecture this evening uh, is in honor of the legendary and wonderful Augusta Baker, who was a legendary children's librarian and also a master storyteller. After an illustrious and amazing career at the New York Public Library, she was there for 37 years, she was storyteller in residence here at the School of Library and Information Science here in Columbia, South Carolina. In addition to her work, as a children's librarian and master storyteller. She was also an author, an educator. She taught in various library, graduate library education programs. She was a mentor to many uh, and a teacher uh, to many storytellers. She was a trailblazer for black librarianship. She was the inspiration for the Baker's Dozen Storytelling Festival that is held every year here in Columbia and hosted by the Richland Library. She served on the American Library Association's Newberry Caldecott Committee. She was a consultant for Sesame Street, and we could spend an hour uh, just talking about all of her accomplishments and the great influence that she had on librarianship, children's literature, uh, including the children's publishing world. And so we are honored to be able to have a position named for her. We are honored to be able to have this lecture and other initiatives and activities here in South Carolina. And we are so very happy to see so many of you uh, turn out for the lecture tonight. It is an honor for us to welcome Dr. Ebony Elizabeth Thomas to give this inaugural lecture uh, in honor of Mrs. Baker. Before I turn it over to our school's director, Dr. David Lankis, for a few words about the school and our 50th anniversary, I just want to acknowledge our co-sponsor, which is the South Carolina Humanities Association. They are a non-for-profit organization whose work is to inspire, engage, and enrich South Carolinians with programs on literature, history, culture, and heritage. And we are very grateful to them for their support of this program. So I'll turn it over uh, to Dr. Lankis. Thank you, Nicole. <clears throat> I will be short because no one's here to listen to me. Uh, but I do want to take this opportunity. I wanted to thank Nicole Cook who has just done an amazing job in a relatively short amount of time here, um, not only revitalizing and pushing forward um, Augusta's legacy, but also really pushing forward the field. Um, we are celebrating this year in sort of a different fashion than we had anticipated, uh, 50 years of library science at the University of South Carolina. It's a program that was born in innovation. It was a program born to not only be different and educate librarians, but to make a difference and educate librarians to make a difference. Um, of course, Augusta Baker was clearly part of that, but as is Nicole Cook, as is our faculty here, really pushing to make an impact so that we have positive uh, developments within society. So I won't sp take too much time other than to thank everyone for being here. I believe this is our largest event that we've probably had since I've been here. So I wanna thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to uh, invite you to continue to be connected to the school, uh, to uh, the work of Nicole Cook, and to really help and join us in ensuring that after this um, horrific pandemic, that we ensure that librarians are there to help our communities not only recover, but improve and push, push forward. Diversity, uh, honoring diversity, inclusion is an essential part to that, and so this is an essential part to our mission. So. Uh, I will now sit back and enjoy with the rest of you. Thank you, Dr. Lankis. Now I'd like to introduce Liz Hartnett, one of my wonderful colleagues here at the school, uh, University of South Carolina, and she is going to introduce our speaker for this evening. Thank you, Dr. Cook, and good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be able to introduce our presenter for this evening, Dr. Ebony Elizabeth Thomas. 
Dr. Thomas is an associate professor in the Literacy, Culture, and International Educational Division at the University of Pennsylvania's Graduate School of Education. A former Detroit Public Schools teacher and National Academy of Education Spencer Foundation postdoctoral fellow, she was a member of the NCTE Cultivating New Voices Among Scholars of Colors 2008-2010 cohort served on the NCTE Conference on English Education's Executive Committee from 2013 until 2017, and is the immediate past chair of the NCTE Standing Committee on Research. Currently, she serves as co-editor of Research of the Teaching of English, and her most recent book is The Dark Fantastic, Race and the Imagination from Harry Potter to the Hunger Games. Dr. Thomas, welcome. Thanks so much for your wonderful introduction. Um, and I want to thank everyone for the kind invitation to join you this evening. Um, again, I want to um, give special thanks to the um, Augusta Baker Endowed Chair, Dr. Nicole Cook, um, as well as her colleagues, um, Christine Shellick and Valerie Bird Ford. Um, you all have been completely amazing um, throughout um, this entire journey. Um, I've been so impressed with everything. I'd also like to thank the sponsors of this event, um, the University of South Carolina's uh, School of Information Science and the South Carolina Humanities. Thank you for having me. Um, even during a time of unprecedented crisis. I gave a version of this talk as a keynote lecture in a very different world um, in conjunction with the University of Wisconsin-Madison's um, Symposium on Childhoods of Color, but I've had to change the beginning and the end of the talk. And um, although I take um, extensive notes and I rehearse before talks, I come out of the Black Baptist Church tradition. Um, I do have family and um, some roots in South Carolina. Um, and I just really um, want to be led by our times and the occasion tonight. So if you're if you'll bear with me, I'm going to keep an eye on the chat and I'm going to um, just go forth. Um, and please, if you have any questions, um, do put them into the um, question and answer um, box provided for you because we will have some time for Q and A. All right, great. So let me get my media working. And here we go. Beyond the Dark Fantastic. How do we close the imagination gap for youth and young adults during a time of unprecedented crisis? Let's revisit our childhoods for just one moment. Hold your breath, make a wish, count to three. Come with me and you'll be in a world of pure imagination. Make a book and you'll see into your imagination. We'll begin with a spin traveling in the world of my creation. What we'll see will defy explanation. If you want to view paradise, Simply look around and do it. Anything you want to do it. You want to change the world. 
There's nothing, nothing to it. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Many of us hear that song or think back to our favorite children's movies and television shows and especially books. And they evoke feelings of nostalgia, don't they? There's no life I know to compare with pure imagination. Living there, you'll be free if you truly want to be. Lyrics like this inspire our childhood fantasies through what we read, view, and experience in children's literature, media, and culture. However, and I think we all know this, not everyone is positioned the same way inside the realm of pure imagination. It's not accessible to everyone in the same way. And even the author of Charlie's Chocolate Factory himself didn't see all kids and teens the same way. But we'll get there in a moment. I, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Childhoods of Color Symposium, um, I introduced the audience to a young man I encountered in my literacies research here in Philadelphia as a young scholar. And that talk was given in a very different context and in a very different world. However, just as I began the talk with a youth voice then, I want to contrast the promise of pure imagination with a plea from 14-year-old Ahmad from West Philadelphia. A multiple scholastic writing award winner, Ahmad talked to my research team a few years ago about what it's like to be young, gifted, black, male, and living in the Overbrook community. He is a student and former mentee of one of my research partners and dear friends, Philadelphia Writing Project teacher consultant, Samuel Reed III. When we inquired of Abad about what kinds of things um, were important to him in his school and neighborhood and life, this is what he told us. We just judged automatically from our brothers and like our just family, we just judged. We just judged to be like that and terrible, like young men already. We're tagged from being African-American and boys. So like there's two strikes for us already. So how do you want to live your life? My research assistant asked them. Without missing a beat, he said, I want to live my life free. Not like I can do whatever I want, just not be judged. I want to live my life free. That was what Ahmad told us so powerfully several years ago. I've lost touch with Ahmad and his friends. That was, that conversation happened six years ago and 14 year old Ahmad would be 20 years old now. And I want you to think along with me about all the many Imads from coast to coast there in South Carolina, here in Philadelphia, in my hometown of Detroit and all over our country. Are they able to live their lives freely? My colleagues and friends, I come before you today, not in a spirit of condemnation during a time when our hearts are tender, our minds and our our souls are um, in agony at the volume and the magnitude of the suffering. And all of humanity groans in shock, in horror, and in pain. The old world is gone. A new world is here. One of the harbingers of that new world, I would submit to you, is the late great children's writer, Walter Dean Myers. Can't say enough good stuff about him. 
Young people like Ahmad fueled his long and storied career. Children's literature is cr critical in the production of freedom. Again, children's literature is critical in the production of freedom for reasons I believe Myers articulated best in an editorial that ran in the New York Times during the spring of 2014, just a few months before his death. He began by recounting what a criminal defense attorney once said about his poor black and male clients. He wrote, the trouble is to humanize clients in the eyes of a, a jury, to make them think of this defendant as a human being and not just one of them. I realized that this was exactly what I wanted to do when I wrote about poor inner city children to make them human in the eyes of readers and especially in their own eyes. I need to make them feel as if they are part of America's dream, that all the lofty rhetoric is meant for them too and that they are wanted in this country. Wow. The life's work of Walter Dean Myers to humanize all children, and in particular, children and teens of African descent, is connected deeply to a protest tradition that is centuries old and in children's literature and librarianship was launched by children's literature diversity leaders um, in the movement for multicultural books, such as Augusta Baker, uh, Charlemagne Rollins, Pura Belpre, and Rudine Sims Bishop, as well as many authors, librarians, educators, and community activists who work with some of the nation's most vulnerable young people today. Augusta Baker was born on April the 1st, 1911 in Baltimore, Maryland, not too far from where I sit. In 1933, she received her bachelor's in education from SUNY Albany. Mrs. Baker earned a BS in library science um, from the same institution in 1934. First, she worked in the New York public library system for 37 years. She was a children's librarian at the 135th Street branch, storytelling specialist, assistant coordinator of children's services, and um, she was coordinator of children's um, services. She rose to the top job during the years that she spent at the New York Public Library. And um, as Dr. Cook noted, her influence cannot be overstated. Um, she served on every single board you could imagine. Um, and then in 1980, she moved right there to Columbia, South Carolina to become your storyteller in residence, where she retired um, in 1994. Augusta Baker left us and went back to the ancestors and to the Lord on February 23rd, 1998. So think about that year, 1998 is when this incredible force within children's literature left us. I wonder what happened 20 years later. This graphic, illustrated by David Huck in consultation with Dr. Sarah Park Dahlin, illustrates statistics from the Cooperative Children's Book Center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. The CCBC has analyzed trends in children's publishing on an annual basis for, I believe it's almost 30 years now, if not over 30. They found that every year, the vast majority of all children's and young adult books published feature white characters, a statistic that has not moved much since the 1960s. This raised public awareness beyond librarian education and publishing. Now, I have to give this credit. There's been some movement over the past five years when it comes to diversity in children's and young adult literature. I also want to note um, what the current global pandemic is doing for all of us who love and care about children and the stories that we produce for them, that we 
use in our classrooms that we select and uh, are in our libraries. We care about all of that. So um, time will only tell how the current moment will affect um, the upward trajectory toward diversity um, or greater diversity in children's literature. Um, however, this, um, like all graphics, um, like all statistics, this represents a snapshot in time from not so long ago. Many of you right here in this room, that's what my notes say, but we're not together in the same room, but where you are in your, <laughs> in your homes as we social distance during the crisis. Oh, going back, <laughs> many of you right here have spent countless hours, days, weeks, months, and years working toward equity and justice and inclusion. I commend you for that. Again, I'm not here in a spirit of condemnation at all tonight. We're all working so hard in our own way on these issues, but, but, but we still have so far to go. This is the end of my 21st year in education. Um, less than half of that time was spent as a classroom teacher. So I taught about seven, um, I taught seven years. And then if you count um, the five summers, maybe I inch toward eight, um, eight and some change. Um, I am finishing my 10th year as university faculty. So I've been, um, I guess I'm officially mid-career. I'm getting signals that I'm no longer a, a young ingenue. And so I don't know much, you know, <laughs> about, you know, how to solve this problem. So that's not what this talk is going to be about today, right? But I've found a couple of things to be true. One of those things that I would submit to you colleagues and friends that is inhibiting us closing this diversity gap once and for all is the dire consequences that a person of color or even a character of color faces when he or she or they step out of their assigned place or flips a script in any way. We are living through the consequences of a person in real life who did that. So 10 years ago, well, can't even say 10 years ago, it's 2020, 15 years ago, if we, if you travel back in time and you talk to your 2005 self and you told yourself in 2005 that we would have a black president named Barack Obama in three years, do you think yourself, your past self, your 2005 self would have believed you? I don't think so. I don't think I would have believed it. Many of us didn't believe it until um, a young Senator Obama won in Iowa in January 2008. So similarly, you know, he stepped out and he flipped the script and, oh, now a Black person can be president. Now, um, if we could close the diversity gap easily, then once we saw a person step out of an assigned place and um, be in a certain role, we would accept it. You know, oh, okay, the guy, you know, he's president and okay, he seems like he's doing a good job. You know, we managed to get through a whole eight years um, time span and there was a black president and nothing happened. But we know <laughs> we are living through a time when we're seeing the consequences of a person of color stepping out of an assigned place and um, maybe getting a little uppity as, you know, unfortunately, um, our history as a nation attests. As it is in real life, so it is in children's books. So it is in young adult fiction. So it is in science fiction, fantasy, comics. These are dress rehearsals for the imagination. Another thing that I found to be true is that essentialized qualities such as goodness, beauty, innocence, and truth have been so often racialized in white, um, racialized in white, yes, as in our literature, in our media, in our culture, that ascribing them to other groups is seen as taking things away from white people. It's not that we can't all be beautiful or all be smart, like all 7.7 .7 billion humans, like we're all cool. And if we all work together, we could probably colonize, you know, the stars or something. Well, oops, colonize, yeah. 
colonial language, right? Um, but instead, it's, you know, we have a zero sum way of thinking about these things. So I wrote a book about all this stuff after musing about it um, throughout my lifetime. The Dark Fantastic, Race and the Imagination, from Harry Potter to the Hunger Games um, took me <laughs> um, an extraordinarily long time to write. I began writing in um, 2013, 2014, that academic year, and it came out at the end of um, last academic year, so 2018, 2019. It took me about five years um, to finish it. And in it, um, I had um, a, a pretty lofty project. I wanted to think about where we've been in this realm of pure imagination over the past few decades and um, to perhaps muse about the pernicious legacies we've inherited from our collective and shared past. And before I leave the slide, I want to emphasize that this is a shared past, right? So um, very often um, in the 2010s, because of um, the, the intractable nature of our problems um, as a nation, as a society. Um, and I, I think that a lot of us have tended to silo ourselves um, off into maybe just biting off enough to um, think about. So I have specialized in Black children's literature, right? And um, I've thought a lot about, um, you know, just race. Um, however, I also am aware that this is just one aspect of the problem. And I think going forward into the 2020s, I'm hoping that in, um, we can move away from um, each working on one part of the issue um, in our corners, because when we get together, it's too conflict laden, and maybe think about coalition building and how do we talk about um, different aspects of diversity, equity, and inclusion in children's books across all these differences. And um, yeah, so um, there are groups that are doing that from We Need Diverse Books um, to the Diversity Jedi um, and many others um, in publishing, librarianship, education, both historic and new. But um, I think that this moment is going to be very illustrative for us. Um, at the end of my talk, I'm gonna to get to um, the pandemic, the idea of pandemic as portal, which I was electrified um, by yesterday um, during, um, but yeah, let me, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is what happens when I get off script. Let me, I'm gonna run through this uh, much faster because many of you um, are probably familiar with the book and my work, but yeah. All right, great. Let's, run through the dark fantastic cycle. In the book, I trace a pattern that I found throughout the Anglo-American science fiction and fantasy tradition that traps black and other racialized characters into a pernicious cycle of violence and death. So first, when a black character appears in the fantastic, it's a spectacle. Wow, why is Rue a little black girl? Wait a minute, that Guinevere is black? There were no black people back then. That spectacle makes many readers and viewers hesitate. They think, wait, she's black, she's innocent, she shouldn't be there. What? Black innocent does not compute. Or, you know, wait a minute, so she's supposed to be the love interest? What? No, not black woman, no. So that this creates a dilemma in the readers or viewers imagination. Most of the time, I argue that this dilemma is reconciled by violence, that violence mirrors the phenomenon of violence toward Black people and others from the margins in the real world. I don't think we can imagine things differently. Um, <laughs> we've been carefully taught to accept this kind of injustice in stories from our very earliest experiences. But while the dark other must die, she cannot die. For this part of the cycle, I draw upon Toni Morrison, who talks about the ways that darkness and Black people haunt all of US literature. So Rue, like so many other Black characters, haunt these stories even after their deaths. In the book, I show how. Subverting this pernicious treatment of the dark other in the fantastic would require radical rethinking of everything that we know and critically conscious activism and storytelling. It is difficult, under-theorized, and messy work. I want to shout out three 
um, emerging scholars who are actually doing that work and I thank them so I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm going to go and write my book about slavery and children's literature next. Um, but three scholars. I First, I wanted to shout out Dr. Stephanie Tolliver, who just finished at the University of Georgia. Um, you, She is someone whose work you should follow. Um, she will be taking a job at um, University of Colorado Boulder. I attended a presentation of her dissertation on Tuesday afternoon, and she is doing everything that I say is is needed for us to look at in create, you know, because it's like, okay, you want to subvert this per, this pernicious treatment. She answers the question of why um, Black creators like Octavia Butler and Nettie Okorafor actually, actually are doing this work, so follow her. And I also want to shout out a couple of graduate students who are also coming up through the wings, Marcus Haynes and Raven Stringfield, and there are so many others. Um, and um, I want to find a way to get their work out there um, more. So, but that is the future. We're going to find out how we got here. How did we get here? All right. A couple of years ago, people were asking me right before the book came out, well, Ebony, <laughs> We know you're writing a book about racism and science fiction and fantasy, but look at what Black Panther has done. Look at Wrinkle in Time. <laughs> so what is, you know, what's going on? And I cover that in the book. I talk a little bit about it in the Vampire Diaries chapter, which um, I, um, I'm i going to talk about each chapter in turn in a moment. But I said, well, a lot of things happened during the 2010s. And once we survive the current um, great influenza plus great depression, we will then be able to go back and look at the 2010s as perhaps an analog to either the Gilded Age or the 1920s. So it was a very you know, weird madcap decade in so many different ways. And I um, would submit to you colleagues that the end of the decade was very, very different than the beginning of it. So after all, as late as March 2012, there wasn't a single network show on television in the United States featuring a Black woman lead as recently as March 2012. That wasn't a long time ago. Feels like it was, you know, many ages, you know, I, okay, I'm not going to quote Tolkien because that's just obnoxious, right? Um, but you know, it feels like, you know, uh, <laughs> Oh my gosh, you know, Atlantis has sunk, has sunk into the sea since that happened, but that was just eight years ago. So over the past eight years, we've been playing cliffhanger with some of these um, inequalities. So, you know, the price is right, you know, y'all need a video. And so I've been watching this trend throughout, you know, the first 10 years of my professorship, right? So like, wow, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening. So it seems like on the surface, um, we're, we have reached a post-Black Panther era. This is an era in which Black directors have $100 million budgets in the world of pure imagination. It seems to be a world where closing the imagination gap is within reach. Um, it seems like it's a world where we're going to, Ebony, what are you talking about? Some dark fantastic cycle? Well, <laughs> later for that, that was like the, uh, what, the second millennium. This is third millennium now, right? Like we had a bunch of false starts in the early 21st century, but it's all good now. Is it really that simple? Are we going to interrupt a half millennium of storytelling and myth and say, Okay, now that some Black creatives are getting a toenail in the door, we're all set. And no one else needs to harangue about decolonization and diversity and all this other good stuff. Also, I want to submit that we are giving adults too much credit for what kids, teens, and young adults are already doing. But I'll get there in a moment. <laughs> Words cannot express how elated I am that it's common knowledge that Hermione is Black in 2015. It is no longer a headcanon. 
It's a widely accepted interpretation of a character described as brown with a hair texture that's never found outside of the African diaspora. There are hundreds of drawings of Hermione depicted as she was written. People are cosplaying her without being asked. Like, shh, they don't look like Emma Watson. This is so beautiful, and I don't know what started it. If it was a text post, a race fit fan cast, or people just collectively coming out and saying, hey, I thought that when reading the books too, but I am forever grateful. This Tumblr post was written five years ago when I first, um, when I was in the weeds of writing this um, book. It was um, by university, then undergraduate at the University of North Carolina, Brianna Harvey. And it's indicative of the ways I argue young people today are reading and writing the self into existence. So even before um, the Afrofuturistic Renaissance, even before um, the year of black girl fantasy in 2018, long before that, black youth and young adults were doing what they have always done, what we have always done from, you know, <laughs> before civil rights, during Jim Crow, on the plantation, on the ships back in the motherland, they basically were doing their own thing anyway. So they were restoring, engaged in this rich restoring of texts that just could not even imagine that they could be um, at the center of, of, of that story. Those texts and the producers of those texts could not even imagine blackness at the center of it. So I wanna begin my talk as I always do by highlighting this act of interpretive freedom to set the stage for a major literary crisis of our times, one that is happening across infinite fantastic worlds. I really wish I had a camera because I have this book. This is the first time I've ever given this talk where I actually have stories about stories right here in my home office. <laughs> Anyway, humans tell stories to make sense of the world around us. This myth-making process forms meta-narratives that shape our society, our culture, and the collective imagination. As noted fantasist Brian Atterbury observes, fantasy is an arena, I believe the primary arena, in which competing claims about myth can be contested and different relationships with myth tried out. Another notable fantasy theorist and a mentor of mine, Farrah Mendelssohn, further theorizes the relationships between the reader and a fantasy story is rhetorical. The reader can enter a portal and go on a quest. Those are my favorite kind. They can immediately be immersed within the fantastic wor world from the first page, the first television scene, or the first swell of the movie score. Well, for me as a reader, sometimes I like to, you know, if I'm just thrown into a story, it does take me a few chapters to catch up and I was like, where am I? Or the fantastic can intrude upon the world the reader knows, or the reader can choose to remain in the liminal space between the real and the unreal. What unites all of these paths into the fantastic is belief. One must believe the world that they're entering. This is a common thread found in both Atterbury and Mendelssohn, which ultimately has its genesis probably in Todorov. Um, Todorov's book, The Fantastic, A Structural Approach to a Literary Genre is um, where I got the, the title of um, The Dark Fantastic, that and also the book, um, The Light Fantastic and my fellow nerds, which one, no, you know, they know what that is anyway. This point of hesitation, whether it's the first flutter of a dragon's wing, blood dripping from a fang, the shimmer of fairy dust, or an otherworldly glow in a character's eyes, is very familiar to readers and viewers and fans. From our earliest years, we are inclined toward finding that point of hesitation that signals the fantastic. However, not everyone is positioned the same way in or by the fantastic. Although it's generally assumed that audiences are positioned to identify with the heroes and heroines in these stories about stories. The fantastic also shapes our collective consciousness toward perceptions of difference. Well, how are people othered in science fiction and fantasy, especially if the um, story world doesn't have our real life um, racial form, um, formations? Well, I argue that Inside speculative fiction, a primary locus of um, alterity is embodied darkness. The traditional 
purpose of darkness in Western narratives tends to be to disturb, to settle, or to cause unrest. This fear of darkness and dark others is so deeply rooted in um, Western mythology that it's almost impossible to find its origin. I know because I tried. When I first um, started writing the book, um, I was on fellowship. So that was when I um, started ramping up my Twitter use. And I got a chance to meet scholars across fields. I said, well, OK, so where um, did this idea that dark is bad? Is this like something that's embedded in our DNA as a species? Or you know, uh, like, what is it? Or that darkness, bad, dark people. You know, I don't get it. And so um, what we found is that, um, well, the medievalists told me it was, you know, in their era. <laughs> so no matter where it comes from, the mysterious unknowability of darkness in nature was extended to a corresponding fear of unknown and unknowable dark things, including imaginary monsters beyond the boundaries of the known world during medieval times. And in the modern period, conquered and enslaved people from beyond Europe's borders. This fear of dark people was written into the United States Constitution, denoting for the ages with a three-fifths compromise that at the time of the founding, enslaved African-Americans were not fully human. The colloquial term by which people of African descent were often known during this late 18th century period, darky, signals that in modern English, darkness has never been deracinated. Oh, please, no. <laughs> Even in the language, darkness gets personified, embodied, and most assuredly racialized. Rooted in both critical race theory and Afro-pessimism, the central claim that I make in the dark fantastic is this. In the Anglo-American fantastic tradition, the dark other tends to be the monstrous thing that is the root cause of hesitation, spectacle, and violence. The dark other is the present absence that lingers at the edges of every fairy tale. She stalks the shadows of the futurist visions of science fiction. She lurks along the margins of the imagined magical paths of high fantasy. She renders the euchronia of alternate history into nonsensical cipher. Perhaps what is most chilling is that even when those who are in darkened and other dreamed in the fantastic, the dark other is still the obstacle to be overcome. Even in stories where all of the characters are white and blue-eyed, recalling Adichie's influential TED talk, The Danger of a Single Story, the dark other is always already there. So when readers who are white, middle-class, cisgender, heterosexual, or able-bodied enter the fantastic dream, they can be empowered and afforded a sense of transcendence that may be elusive within the real world. However, this often means that the implicit me message that readers, hearers, and viewers of color receive as we read these texts is that we are the villains. We are the horde. We are the enemies. We are the monster. <laughs> is it is it any wonder that black kids sometimes just don't want to read? You know, we deficitize them. <laughs> we're not really thinking about what we're giving them to read. So for many readers, viewers, and fans of color, I argue that at the level of consciousness to participate in this kind of storying is to watch yourself be slain. And justifiably so, as the story recounts. In fairy tales, it was you who terrorized the hapless villagers. It was you who kidnapped the fair princess. It was you who dare wage war against the dashing hero. It was you who had pre-existing um, pre conditions. It was you, <laughs> oh my goodness. It was you who chose to go to church or a family gathering or something like that. It was you, you did it. You are the jealous darker sister who wishes to steal the fair maiden's pedestal for yourself. If you're present at, in the story at all, you are relegated to the margins. To watch a science fiction film is often to learn that you have no future. Um, the Expanse, 
Star Trek, et cetera, accepted. But in most others, you, you're not there. There are only two people of color there. And then you start scratching your head and you don't want to think much about it. Very often when you appear on the page or on the screen, you are a slave, a servant, or a prostitute. Even your very body is not your own. If you have words, your speech serves only to support the narrative, never to subvert it. Rarely is the narrative focalized through your eyes. You are rendered abject, fungible, socially dead. You are the alien other. You are the orc. You are the fell beast. The very presence of the dark other in a text of speculative fiction across genre and mode creates a profound ontological dilemma. This dilemma is inescapable for readers and for writers and must be reconciled. This dilemma is most often resolved by enacting textual violence against the dark other. This is what we all expect because it mirrors the unending spectacle of violence against the undarkened and the othered in our own world. The fantastic has need of darkness because these stories about stories, oh, so innocent, but these stories require our flesh. They require both heroes and villains, fair princesses and evil crones, valiant deeds and nightmarish beasts. The fantastic requires both Medusa's uh, and Grendels and Chimeras and Manticores, tricksters and fools. It needs the dark other as its source of hesitation, the very spectacle that causes the heart to skip in fear. It desires the dark other's violent end as a form of ritual sacrifice, purging the very source of darkness and righting the wrongs of the world before returning to haunt the happy ending. The first principle of the dark fantastic cycle is that a spectacle. Even in 2020, audiences still marvel at the presence of a dark skinned protagonist from Jared Saxton. Sorry, from Jared Sexton, need water. To read that quote for yourself. In a world structured by the twin axioms of white superiority and black inferiority, of white existence and black non-existence, a world structured by a negative categorical imperative. Above all, don't be black. In this world, the zero degree of world transformation is the turn toward blackness, a turn toward the shame, as it were, that resides in the idea that I am thought of as less than human. The three girl characters that I focus in depth um, on in the Dark Fantastic are Bonnie of the Vampire Diaries, Rue from the Hunger Games, and Gwen or Guinevere in the BBC's Merlin. Each girl's story gets featured in her own chapter. While Bonnie and Rue both have their origins in popular young adult fiction novels, Gwen is a recent reimagining of young Queen Guinevere from the Arthurian legends. While Bonnie and Gwen were originally white in their source texts, Rue was not, but was famously read that way by millions of readers. In my analyses, I found that once a text is transmediated in colorblind casting, I prefer non-traditional casting as a term because um, the former term is kind of ableist. Um, um, non-traditional casting results in a dark-skinned actress playing a fantastic role on screen. The result is a visual spectacle, a signal that this is not like the usual story. The second principle of the dark fantastic is that of hesitation. She's not supposed to be there. She's wreaking havoc on the order, harmony, and happiness of all that is right and light and bright and white. She must be contained, subjugated, and ultimately destroyed in order for the fantastic dream to work. This leads to the third principle. The diplomatic presence of the dark other must be resolved via violence whether driven by desire, fear, longing, anger, rage, some other impulse, darkness has to be destroyed or there's no story. Um, scholars of race from Hazel Carvey to Michelle Alexander have noted the ways that containment and destruction of black bodies works in the real world. 
The fantastic is driven by similar imperatives at the symbolic level. The dark other is subjected to textual violence, which often results in character death. From Robin Bernstein's Racial Innocence, slavery had been legitimized in part by widespread claims that African Americans were impervious to pain. Thomas Jefferson, for example, famously wrote in 1781's Notes on uh, the State of Virginia that our griefs are, talking about Black people, our, their griefs are transient. At stake in pain was not only justification for violence, but also eligibility for citizenship and humanity. But yet this death is not permanent. When the dark other is defeated and catharsis is reached, um, our, their <laughs> present absence nonetheless haunt the story. Toni Morrison referred to this haunting as romancing the shadow in playing in the dark. These speculations have led me to wonder whether the major and champion characteristics of our national literature and our nation period, individualism, masculinity, social engagement versus historical isolation, acute and ambiguous moral problematics, the thematics of innocence coupled with an obsession with figurations of death and hell are not in fact responses to a dark, abiding, signing Africanist presence. The dark other is necessary for the fantastic, but nobody wants her there. She must be destroyed, but her shade has to remain. So can't even rest in death, you have to still stick around. So that's my next dilemma. The dark other must die, but they or we cannot die. The dark one haunts the text because they can't escape. Morrison once again provides much insight into this textual fettering. The ways in which artists and the society that bred them transferred internal conflicts to a blank darkness consisting of conveniently bound and violently silenced black bodies is a major theme in American literature. Black slavery enriched the country's creative possibilities. For in that construction of blackness and enslavement could be found not only the not free, but also with the polarity created by skin color, the projection of the not me. The result was a playground for the imagination. Not free, not me. But there's hope. So much hope. The final principle and step of the dark fantastic cycle is emancipation. It's only reached when the dark other is liberated from the cycle of spectacle, embodied hesitation, violence, and haunting. Narratives with liberated dark others are rare, rare, although we're getting more, and they're rarely as popular as those that feature trapped dark subjectivities. People ask me, Ebony, why are you concentrating on, you know, the one black character in these you know, uh, multi-million dollar or billion dollar properties? You know, why don't you just focus on, um, on, you know, on voice, on vo I knew I was going to slur on own voices, ah, the W. <laughs> So here's the answer to that question, this very thing, because we, you know, we do read um, Black folks who are into science fiction and fantasy, we do read Octavia Butler, Nettie Okorafor, N.K. Jibison, um, and then on the youth side, all of us anticipated and gobbled up Tommy Adeyemi's Children of Blood and Bone. Um, we love Danielle Clayton's The Bells. We love, and I can go on and on and on. But then at the end of the day, once we finish reading all those, once you finish binging Black Lightning, um, everybody else in the world is still watching Game of Thrones. Everybody else is still watching The Witcher. Everybody else is still watching all of the stories I've been talking about, and they interact with Black people. Remember at the beginning of my talk, I um, posited that stories are when your imagination has dress rehearsal for your actions in real life, right? So we're, we're inspired by stories to, to do things, to act. Stories teach us how to treat each other. That's why I do the work that I do while applauding other kinds of work. I argue that this is um, less um, common 
even among own voices literature. Um, I have an article that I wrote after The Dark Fantastic trying to see whether or not recent young adult literature broke um, that cycle. And unfortunately, probably because of a lack of diversity in publishing, <laughs> Um, and um, I thank Lee and Lowe books for doing that study um, twice. Um, and um, Sarah Park, Dr. Sarah Park Dolan, and then Dr. Laura Jimenez um, as um, principal investigators on that. Um, you know, we have a lot of dead um, Black girl characters in YA literature written by Black authors, too. And it's not saying that they're not doing a better job subverting the cycle, but what is it about mainstream <laughs> publishing or education or librarianship where, you know, we're, we're, we're comfortable in this country with Black death in ways that I want us to interrogate. I love what Kevin Young, the director of the Schomburg Center and poet, had to say about this in the Gray Album, though, that the Lost Shadow Book is the book that Blackness writes every single day. The book that memory, time, accident, and the more active forms of oppression prevent from being read. It is the symbolic book that slavery really banned, a book of belief. The Black imagination conducts its escape by ways of, by underground railroads of meaning, a practice we could call the Black art of escape. He begins the great album whimsically by talking about the shadow book. So when I talk to Black authors, and um, I know almost everyone in children's literature, and I hope they don't uh, get mad at me and stop talking to me because I'm going to spill their business. They all have a shadow book, okay? <laughs> so there's the book of their heart and imagination, and then there's the book that will sell well. There's the book that audiences will accept, okay? So I wanted to note that emancipation is hard. It is hard. It's very difficult because it does require us truly reimagining, restoring everything we know and have heard and have been taught and making the world anew, Langston Hughes. All right. So it's the nature of scholarship to question one's own work. So people will say, eh, yeah, I have quibbles with the dark fantastic. I said, oh, girl, me too. Yep, I could have done this, I would have that. So <laughs> that's all of it. So in the years since this book has entered the world, the theory has been both lauded and challenged, but that's the nature of knowledge. Things are never static, they're ever changing. And as scholars, we change with it. Everything in our culture demands the positioning of this dark other as antagonist. But I recommend that you read some counter narratives to inspire your librarianship, your creative work, your teaching, wherever you are touching the lives of kids. It's so important to balance both halves of the equation. Um, you know, not to be, you know, too sad or depressed. And I know I'm saying this during a, you know, a horrible crisis, but then also to um, be, you know, wary of being too easily um, satisfied with um, the status quo. Because sometimes when you scratch the surface, you see the same old systems um, working underneath. All right, we have about 10 more minutes. I know it's a long talk. I wanna talk about some of the signs of change. Change is already happening and in more ways than all of us might realize. And I'm gonna run through this pretty fast because current events of early 2020 mean that I don't have to explain or walk people through some of this stuff. <laughs> because um, all through the 2010s, which was a very wacky decade, it was like, you know, some people, um, you know, operated via hope. They did see things changing. But then especially during the first, um, the last four years of the decade, people moved from being hopeful about possibilities and changes to despair. So um, we'll probably um, note that later on in history, you know, once you and I are, are, are gone, later generations will note it. But yeah, this is what's happening now. And a lot of people have observed it. Texts are, are fundamentally not stable. The last time I gave this talk, everybody was in schools and, um, you know, mainly face to face. Um, few of us, K-12 and in higher education were um, engaged in um, sustained distance learning of this time, involuntary distance learning. So I don't need to tell you that texts are changing. We are living through that. 
currently. Because of text changing, um, people are become, people's relationships with text and textuality and narrative has also changed. I also don't need to talk to you about digital intimacy. Um, this lecture will be recorded. <laughs> I talk about this in the book and in some papers, but I just feel as if this is you know, now redundant <laughs> because you all all know about digital intimacy because we have all lived the Zoom life, the Google Hangout life, and <laughs> the Blue Jeans life over the past month. And we have, many of us have had to interact with loved ones in both um, tender ways and also in tragic ways digitally. And so there will never be, when I first um, began writing about digital intimacy, it was in a 2011 article and people thought it was a little wacky, like digital, like, you know, but no, now everybody's there, right? Um, some people didn't like that um, I gave Hamilton credit for, um, you know, sort of subverting um, the story of the United States founding by casting people of color in those roles. So that was one reaction I had um, from um, to the dark fantastic. And I still think that, you know, um, again, I'm being a, a horrible professor here. It's, I mean, like, this is just how professors do. It's like, oh, nothing is all good or all bad. So like, Hamilton's not all bad. Like, you know, and I, I do, I'm aware of Ishmael Reed's critique. I cite Lynn Mondero's critique of it. Gotcha. However, it was amazing when Philippa Sue, a woman of color, in the voice of Eliza Hamilton in the most popular musical on Broadway talks about putting herself back into the narrative. I mean, that was dope. I'm, <laughs> that's off script, but that's dope. Like what? That is tremendous. That's amazing. And we're seeing, we saw that impulse all throughout the first two decades of the 21st century, people seizing meaning and reclaiming narrative because of um, these new digital tools and the collapse of space-time um, and the ways that we communicate with each other. Many of you um, are familiar with Adichie's um, Danger of a Single Story talk. It's one that, you know, I think still holds up pretty well. Um, she's talking about a Nigerian woman who um, insists that she needs to tell the author how her story should end. And certainly after a decade and more of Twitter culture, we all know that audiences. I mean, and again, um, at the time that I was writing, I had no idea Game of Thrones would end the way that it did. I mean, I thought we were done with that with lost ending. Um, Damon Lindelof has redeemed himself with Watchmen, the adaptation of Watchmen, and I highly um, suggest that. Not children's literature. Do not, you know, like once you put your kids to bed, that's something that you know you could you could watch. But yeah, so everybody like this is not revolutionary anymore. This is common knowledge. You know, if people don't like your story, they're going to take the social media, Twitter, Instagram, um, TikTok, and they're going to tell you about it. Um, I began observing the phenomenon of bending when, and when I was um, in fandom. So um, because so many um, transmedia texts, so texts that are adapted for stage, for screens, large and small, tended to not be diverse, um, especially um, before five years ago. So anything before 2015, I mean, that landscape was pretty, um, um, yeah, it was pretty, um, yeah, there weren't any people of color. Um, I noticed that millennial and generation Z, tweens, teens, and um, generation X, um, not X, Z, wrong gender, um, they were starting to bend characters. So they would read these stories um, from Harry Potter to the Hunger Games to Percy Jackson. And of course now Rick Riordan has the Rick Riordan present series that has been critiqued, but you know, it's also um, an example of it. Um, you know, so there are, you know, they're, they're starting to bend. They're so hungry to see themselves in narrative that they are taking to social media and have been for the past 20 years and more 
and casting themselves and their cultures into those characters. And I was first struck by it during the polar vortex of 2014 when I was stuck in um, the house a lot, pen council classes. And so I was looking at Tumblr and I noticed that um, young people, young artists were race bending frozen because they said they were tired of yet another Disney movie with a blonde princess. And I thought, okay, you know, again, growing up in the 80s before the Disney Renaissance, I thought, well, that's just what Dis Disney princesses do. Um, so they were beginning, they had Elsa race bend from cultures all over the world. There was an Inuit Elsa, there was a black Elsa, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I took a detached stance toward this until I met Jessica Popescu of Romania. She was a young artist who was race bending Varda from Tolkien's Legendarium. And when I saw the drawing on your on the right of your screen, I cried like a baby. You know, you don't realize that you need that you wanted or longed for representation until you have it. Like I didn't care for you know 30 years. Let's see, I was 40 when Star Trek Discovery came out. I didn't care that there was no black woman captain. You know, Trek was my stuff. It was one of the mainstream properties where we always had representation. And then came Michael Burnham. You do not know what you have what you have been missing sometimes until you actually get it. And so, um, and many of you have already read um, this passage in both the Dark Fantastic and in my article with my research partner Amy Storniaiolo about restoring the self. There's evidence to support the idea that readers contribute imaginatively to the fictional stories they consume. I think the second part of the quote that I've highlighted, different readers experience the same text differently, needs to be raised every time we want to talk about racial achievement gaps in literacy education. Just saying. Um, again, in some of my other work, I, um, you know, because another hat I wear is as an education, um, a literacy scho um, scholar, educational researcher, and so I've done a lot of work with um, my research partner, um, who's also at Penn, Amy Storniaiuolo, and my um, wonderful graduate student research team, the Super Friends, so um, shout out to Josh Coleman, Dr. Josh Coleman, who's starting at um, San Jose State University in the fall, um, Christopher Rogers, who reviews for um, Booklist and um, Kirkus and some others. Um, yeah, just I have an amazing Rabani Garg, who is a specialist in South Asian children's and young adult literature, media and culture. So I have a wonderful team. We constantly, we're obsessed with this stuff. So we're looking at how reader and author relationships play out in youth literacy practices as forms of restoring. And um, we recently won a significant grant from the McDonald Foundation right before everything, you know, um, the center stopped holding. And so we're really excited to be thinking about digital digital discourse and how people are, um, how this is working online. Again, um, you know, post-pandemic or in a pandemic, we're in the eye of a storm, colleagues and friends. And so some of what I've been arguing, oh, you know, for about a decade, it seems to um, be moving into what Freire had um, famously called on the first page, chapter one of the Pedagogy of the Oppressed, an inescapable concern. Like every time I feel discouraged about um, injustice, racism, sexism, class struggle, I open up um, Freire's uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And he began, it's almost like he's there, um, you know, speaking to you. Um, I met him when I was 14 years old, and he talks about the problem of humanization. And it's something that I've taken seriously ever since I found, you know, I read that book when I was in my um, young adulthood. And he talks about, you know, problem, the problem of humanization and dehumanization it has, you know, always been a problem for our species. But now it's taken on the nature of an inescapable concern. But while both of those are possibilities, only the first is the people's vocation. That means that our task is only to ever humanize, never to dehumanize. And part of that is closing the imagination gap and reconciling the crisis of race and the imagination. 
all worlds are possible and so are all protagonists. Pure imagination liberated, dar in darkened, and made whole. I want to um, close out because I said I would give you know ten minutes. I'm just going to close by seven ten. <laughs> Uh, period, because I do want to leave um, 20 minutes for questions and answers. Um, I would um, strongly encourage all of you, if you have found anything of value in my talk, um, know that my work is very much representative of the period between 2000 and 2019, really 2016. So my book was very, it's very strongly um, a book of the first two decades of the 21st century. We are in a new world. Um, I was electrified and inspired by um, a, a talk. Um, Arundhati Roy, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing um, her first day, but I is one of my favorite writers right now. And Imani Perry, Professor Imani Perry, who um, is so inspiring, they were in conversation about Roy's idea of the pandemic as a portal. And so when I was redesigning my slides, I was thinking, oh, you know, a portal and just thinking about, you know, and if you think about a wormhole, science fiction nerd, not a scientist, you know, you can only, <laughs> Um, theoretical physicists think that if human travel through wormholes is possible, you're probably not going to be able to go through <laughs> because of all the laws of physics. You're not going to be able to go back and forth through a wormhole like people did on Deep Space Nine. It's only going to be one way. And that is the way, friends, that time works for us. We can only move forward. So um, before the pandemic, March 1st, the world before March 1st, was a different world. It informs where we are now, but it's not where we are. So I would strongly encourage you to look at that. Through the portal, I've been thinking about, um, you know, well, is it just um, white or um, non-Black um, creators that um, fall into the dark fantastic cycle? So I wrote an article um, um, for a special issue of The Line in the Unicorn with Kate Capshaw and Michelle Martin, two of my colleagues, and um, I asked some questions about um, where we go or how we might think about this beyond an Afrofuturist lens. I think Afrofuturism is an amazing paradigm. I have questions about it, um, whether or not we're stretching it. So anything that's black and has in black and has magic or black and is on a spaceship is Afrofuturistic. I have so many questions about that. And so I asked them in what is now um, temporarily, I guess, or maybe forever, an open access article. And um, yeah, I'm so excited. I'm, a fr I'm frightened. My city is um, in the crucible once again. Um, Detroit is ever with me, but once upon a time, I was a, a little black girl in Detroit, dreaming, dreaming, dreaming of, of shared futures, of um, worlds beyond what I was experiencing. And colleagues and friends, I'm here to say, be encouraged, be well, Be mindful and continue doing the good work that you are doing in this brave new world. Thank you. All right, so that is the talk. That took longer. Um, I lingered and there are still almost 200 people here. That is just really nerve wracking. I can't believe it. It feels like I just talked to the trees on the Wissahickon Trail in Northwest Philadelphia. <laughs> I'm sitting in my office by myself. So this is so much fun. So yeah, great. All right, I guess we're gonna go straight to questions and answers because we have a little less than the 20 minutes. So, um, Tamanda Henderson, hello, was wanting to know about the purpose of literature for young readers. Wow. 
literature for young readers has uh, manifold purposes, um, both benign and not. So um, I really wish that we were able to be in an audience together so that we could um, dialogue more about that. Because that is the answer to that would be an entire textbook, right? So there are so many different purposes for children's literature, um, you know, to entertain, to inform, to inspire, to warn. Um, just to exhort. Sometimes they do more than one of those at once. I don't think most books, or there are very few books that um, do all of that at once. But I think um, the purpose of literature for young readers, I mean, we could go, you know, I mean, would it be um, what Huck tells us it is? Um, I use Botelho and Rudman, and we talk about the purposes of literature for young people. Um, yeah, I think it um, it depends. And again, that is a very literacy researcher response to that question. So um, I do say that all of us who work in children's literature, we're all coming from it. Um, we're all coming from a different angle. So um, my perspective is as someone who um, is steeped in reader response in um, literacies, and I was also trained by linguists as a discourse analyst. So I um, I analyze talk, and I tend to analyze text um, in those ways. So I pay attention to the language used, um, the prosody of a text. Um, yeah. So those are, um, and then so, and I'm sitting in a college of education or a school, a graduate school of education, which means that. Um, I do believe that children's literature um, exists differently in education and um, as it should than it does in schools of library and information science as, and it exists or looks different when you're in a department and when you're in a department of English or childhood studies or elsewhere in the humanities. We have colleagues in history who think about childhood. Um, yeah, so, um, and that's why organizations like the Children's Literature Association and the Children's Literature Assembly tend to be so interesting because um, I think it's not often acknowledged in the field that we are all coming from, we're all rooted in different um, disciplinary perspectives. So I hope that answers your question. Are there others? Let's see. I'm scrolling up. Ooh, this is a good one. Hi, Todd. Todd Hoppuck. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Oh, great. Dr. Thomas, I wonder if you could speak about your observations on queer representation, gay and lesbian representation, trans representation, and non-binary gender representation. Also, do you think queer representation is a heavier or easier lift than people of color? Heavier. Um, is it easier to be published if your protagonists are queer white characters? Yes. I'm going to answer your question in full in a minute. This is a good one. Are black queer characters too much other otherness to find a place? Or are there places now in sci-fi and fantasy where black queerness is represented? Thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for this question. Because I have only one little note on when I talk about my methods. Um, in the first couple of chapters of the Dark Fantastic, one of the some of the biggest you know things I wish I had been able to tackle, and that um, I believe the rising generation of scholars, librarians, and teachers will you know be able to tackle in their sleep with um, one hand tied behind their back um, is intersectionality. So I really was only looking at race. And I only ended up thinking about Black girlhood, but not necessarily from a Black feminist perspective. So those are things that the scholars I named um, in who are working on race are um, covering and, um, you know, deeply concerned with. 
Um, I know Stephanie is work, her work is um, really deeply steeped in a black feminist perspective and she's looking at black girlhood. I'm not sure whether or not Marcus or Raven are looking at black queer narratives, but we're starting to get um, a really interesting cohort of doctoral students and then um, some master students who are um, keenly interested interested in thinking about um, intersections among race, um, sexuality, gender, class, et cetera. Here's the thing about why we don't have more of that critical work, because um, the academy is truly an int moot. And again, you know, Tolkien, you know, um, we speak in entish. And because the bars um, for um, academic work tend to be um, context dependent. So, um, if you are if you are if you are in a program that understands children's and young adult literature well, and also has um, faculty or departments that are strong in um, gender, women's sec and sexuality studies, and or have younger scholars over in Africana or in Latinx, Latin American studies or Asian um, um, Pacific American studies, um, Native um, American or Native Indigenous studies, then you are probably gonna have a more lit dissertation than those of us who were in programs that trained us so well, like, I mean, you know, to do academic work, but really we're not, we're, we're not necessarily places where we're getting the tools, um, not the, the tools to do good intersectional work. The reason why I didn't touch upon um, some of the topics that I mentioned or we uh, um, in Todd's question in the Dark Fantastic is that it's better to acknowledge what your book doesn't do and call for more work than it is to do it poorly. And as an academic journal editor, People are really, you know, rushing work out. And listen, I get it from a social justice perspective, but um, I think that your work has great impact if you let it steep and cook. And I do think that there are now um, a growing number of scholars that are doing that work. Another one who is doing intersectional work um, is um, Angel Daniel Matos, who is just, his work is, absolutely phenomenal. And he does both Latinx, um, YA, and he also does uh, queer and um, gay YA and teaches in those subjects and is, um, you know, faculty, um, I'm trying to remember where he's um, moving, but, you know, so that, but again, that's a scholar who has um, trained within the past 10 years. So um, we need that scholarship and then in publishing, we need publishing to be brave, even in a time of crisis. So I am concerned that post pandemic publishers are gonna be hurting as the economy um, slows or you know, maybe even crashes. And the problem is that whenever we have moments like that, whenever there are economic contractions, creatives of color suffer, queer creatives suffer. And then finally, one of the challenges of getting queer um, YA, and especially children's and middle grades books, is the censorship imperative. And certainly, many of you are situated um, there um, at USC's um, School of Library and Information Science. And so um, often, the fear is that, you know, if they're banning books with Black characters, and then they're banning books, you know, with trans um, characters or gay or lesbian characters, par whether parents or children in the books, then what would they do if, you know, um, with um, intersectional children's literature, or I'm using intersectionality in a strange way, what would they do if you have uh, multiple marginalizations um, in the book? Would districts ban it? And so um, publishing, um, you know, some of it is the system, you know, I rail against the system all the time. And also the system is influenced by um, what the largest districts and library systems will buy. And so that's why we have the kinds of books that we get. That was a really good question. All the best to you, um, Todd. Liz, thanks.
Your statement on how our responsibility is to always humanize, not dehumanize, touched me deeply. I'd like to ask how you see this statement and the ideas you discussed today as a lens for pushing back on both sideism. That is actually a real term. <laughs> You know, because we've been talking a lot about this in the current national and global crisis, right? So when I was 14 years old, um, you know, they were always, there was a lot more public money to do things for, I tweeted about this years ago before I started ranting about, you know, <laughs> the way black women are treated on the internet, right? But back when I had fewer followers and I had a much more benign Twitter presence, which was much more like my real life presence, if you know me, um, I, I was talking a little bit about how weird it was to grow up between, you know, like the end of the civil rights movement and then now like where there was momentary some public money, never enough to like, you know, save the black kids in the ghetto. Sorry, I just, I just don't want to say it. But like there were constantly programs for kids who were in teens who I guess, you know, weren't, you know, setting, you know, things on fire. It was just so weird. It was like, you could like go back and like sort of analyze some of that late 20th, 20th century stuff. So there was a lot of public money around. And I ended up going to the University of Michigan for a program that, you know, existed for about 10 years and doesn't exist anymore. And I never forget, there was this um, elderly man with kind eyes who didn't really speak, um, you know, like, I mean, he has, I believe he was soft-spoken. And the people who were my work supervisors when I was up there that summer, one of them is a famous, famous um, higher ed professor, um, Sylvia Hurtado. Ebony, come and meet, this is Paulo Freire. And of course, I am 14 years old, right? I don't know who this is. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, I was, you know, maybe not as cool as some of your teenagers. I was like kind of frightened. And, you know, I shook his hand and they were like, oh, she's from Detroit, et cetera. And in my brain, I was like, I dedicated my dissertation to uh, Frere and my mom because, you know, I didn't know back then. And so um, he is one of my comfort reads, reading the beginning of, um, of uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, you know, thinking about the children's literature of the oppressed. But then, you know, I, I'm listening to younger and newer scholars who are saying, you know, no, we need to, we're not just the marginalized, we're not just the oppressed, we're also the global majority. We're also those who are building this new world together. But, you know, it's right here since I'm in my home office. And, um, you know, he, um, you know, I'll just um, read just a little, um, I just want to read the quote that I kind of mangled while I was giving the talk. And um, you can Google it. And I think at least the first chapter is, um, is, is available for you online. And I'm just going to skip um, and just read the most, um, the parts that I always go back to on those days when I leave my K-12 job, you know, in the 2000s, or I left campus at Wayne State or Penn crying because I thought, you know, they're never going to accept me as a mentor. They don't, you know, like that this is, I can't, what am I doing as a professor? Frere writes, while the problem of humanization has always been from an axiological point of view, been humankind's central problem, it now takes on the character of an inescapable concern. Concern for humanization leads at once to the recognition of dehumanization, not only as an ontological possibility, but as an historical reality. And as an individual perceives the extent of dehumanization, he or she or they may ask if humanization is even a viable possibility. Within history and concrete objective contexts, both humanization and dehumanization are possibilities for a person as an uncompleted being being conscious of their incompletion. Now, this next sentence, I have carried, with this, carried this with me for my 21 years in education. But while both humanization and dehumanization are real art alternatives, only the first is the people's vocation. This vocation is constantly negated, but it's affirmed by that very negation. It is thwarted by injustice, exploitation, oppression, and the violence of the oppressors. It is affirmed by the yearning of the oppressed for freedom and justice, and by their struggle to recover their lost humanity. 
I mean, that's just, it's so powerful because every time I want to quit and I was like, you know, I began my um, high school, I, uh, not high school, I began my college education at Florida a &M University in Tallahassee. My grandma grew up in Florida. And so I wanted to go down there for undergrad. It's an HBCU in Tallahassee. And um, I was going to be a business major because I thought how I made social change was to make a lot of money and open a bank in Detroit or a credit union so that I could finance people's businesses. And I just, um, you know, I, I sometimes I wondered, you know, like, well, you know, was this educator's path the wave? Like, maybe I could have made more impact. But, you know, that, you know, we all as educators, as librarians, as good people in the world with a heart toward humanity, you know, you do have a choice. Like daily, we have a choice toward humanization um, to, to, to humanize or dehumanize. And certainly all of us, including me, especially me. Like, it's so easy for me to want to dehumanize. Like right now I'm mad. Like I want to dehumanize and, you know, rail at people who um, enabled certain things that I feel are unjust or not, not just, right? So I want to wish bad things. But I think that in order to build a new world together, we have to choose the path of humanization and then work out, press out together what that means. So, yeah. Well, it's 730 and I don't know if there are any other questions. Listen, I am easily readily available because I have, um, you know, I'm on Twitter. I lock it down every night because there's trolls and, um, you know, um, especially as we get closer to the election, um, you know, um, uh, sometimes women from the margins who are loud on the internet, you know, but please, you know, if you tweet at me or if you um, email me, um, oh, there are lots more questions. Okay, cool. And you know, I'm, I'm here until eight <laughs> and because I'm home, you all can't see me like walking around or doing anything else. All right. So let me see. <laughs> oh, this is a good one. Anastasia Collins. Hello. I think this is Stacy. Okay. Um, if not, hi, um, but I think I know this questioner. If pain, oh, hi, Stacey. <laughs> One of my librarian friends, I have lots of them. I'm a librarian fangirl, as I told the workshop on, on Wednesday. All right, if pain, trauma, and destruction of the dark is embedded in genre conventions and even definitions, are we able to break out of the cycle of demanding Black characters' pain, trauma, death to make them legible to the white imagination, but dehumanizing them through the fetishization of the same pain, trauma, death? Must the burden always be on readers and audiences to bend and reimagine and write themselves back in? If so, how do educators integrate those skills and practices in youth readers? That is an amazing question. It's an amazing question. Um, and Stacey, I'm, I can um, email you or inbox you um, or, um, no, I think they linked it. The notes to a Black Fantastic. I mean, I really haven't talked a lot about that article because I don't want people to think that I'm critiquing the, um, you know, sort of the harbingers of that year of Black girl fantasy. So I wanted to look at pre-2017 um, narratives with Black girls. And again, because of the way I work, I don't really do a lot of survey research, like where I think the last article where I wrote, like I was writing about a zillion texts at once was um, my 2011 article about um, landscapes and urban Y. But other than that, because of the way I was trained, um, I always look at a few things in depth instead of looking at many different things. And I think both approaches are fine. But I say all that to say, um, one of the things that me and um, some of my diversity Jedi critic friends, oh, shout out to all of them. I did not shout out. Um, I did mention Sarah Park Dolan, who was one of the creators of the 2018 um, graphic, but I mean, there's so many of us. Okay, well, you know, but I just wanted to like, Stacy is also part of the Diversity Jedi. And, um, but yeah, like sometimes we're like, you know, we don't say it out loud, but sometimes creators of color, which is why I mentioned the shadow book and I'm hoping if somebody hasn't taken the title, my next book is gonna be about the shadow book book, which is um, because of the ways in which racial difference was set up in the United States, children's literature, media, and culture is super peculiar. It's just odd, like in a lot of different ways. And one of those ways is that 
yeah, like people don't believe like black people are like just as human as them. Like we we have all the same, um, <laughs> like all the same personality types. And so, you know, like I'm not really, you know, like anyway, we it's just so weird. And so um, author after author after author after author has told me about being encouraged to write black pain narratives. I am not going to share any confidences because I know there are people on this call, but <laughs> you know, sometimes editors and agents, they want you to like write and, you know, like write more stuff or, you know, make it more dramatic. Let this black, you know, black character and this black kid die. And I think I'm right about the fact that people are drawn more to those black pain narratives or keeping it real or that kind of thing, then they are to um, narratives where you have more liberation or emancipation. The proof is in the pudding. The proof is in what people talk about. I don't want to really spill the tea and go and have my students run a whole corpus analysis of like, you know, something like Twitter or Tumblr over the past 10 years. I'm like, okay, you know, Whiz, you know, whiz kids, go run this and go and find how many times Octavia Butler was actually talked about. I find that people tend to, the people tend to fetishize um, black authors as avatars. And then when you begin talking to them about what the books are actually about, um, some people, um, they're not really clamoring for them in the same way. They don't have the same number of fandom, um, you know, fan works. It's just, you know, so it's like we're talking about one thing and we're doing another. And here again, I have to shout out Danielle Clayton. Um, and I think that's okay because I'm an NBA judge this year. And I don't think, I don't think she had a book that came out this year, but she was absolutely right. She called us out. We were at the Nerds of Color gathering at an SDCC and she pointed out, she says, you know, there are all these people of color, but we are invested in fanning mainstream content, mostly by white creators. And so I do think we have more, um, we have a way to go when it comes to um, completely moving into a new world. When I see just as many people fanning um, N.K. Jemison's The Broken Earth um, as fangirled um, Game of Thrones, I will shut up and I'll write about something else. Until then, y'all have got me. But yeah, I do think that the ways in which the systems are set up and also audiences, you know, the flip side of audiences race bending is audiences being drawn to some kinds of content and then um, black authors and uh, LGBTQ authors um, and others complaining or not even complaining because that's not what it is, but noting their lack of sales compared to others. from Ivan Torsano. Hi, Ivan. I was wondering, do we see the presence of the dark other in fantasy stories with an all black cast of characters? So stories where also non-white readers are empowered. Yes, um, I actually wrote about that in Notes Toward a Black Fantastic. And then I've decided I'm gonna stop and write my book about slavery and children's literature because I've done all that, you know, I've done research on that. And um, I kind of want to um, have this next generation of rising scholars in um, children's and YA across fields. I feel like the millennials and Generation Z need to write back to me because I, you know, I'm in early middle age and I'm feeling it because I was just like, this is depressing when I began looking at some of the text and looking at the fact that some of the tropes still existed in those books. And um, I had a conversation with um, Rebecca Wanzo, who wrote a book that um, I highly recommend, and I'm hoping that um, our folks can um, put into the chat. It just came out. Um, it's called The Content the Content of Their Caricature. So The Content of Their Caricature. And it just came out from NYU Press. It's on the same line, um, the same, um, imprint as The Dark Fantastic was on Postmillennial Pop, which is edited by um, critical theorist um, Karen um, Tongson, who just was the first Asian uh, 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 person um, to, to make tenure um, um, in her school at University of Southern California, and um, noted and famed media scholar um, Henry Jenkins, who's become a mentor of mine. But Rebecca and I were actually talking about this, and I'm just going to quote I'm just going to say one line from that conversation, um, and it was kind of both of us. Go back and revisit all of Octavia. 
I mean, she is incredible. She is amazing. But sort of this rah, rah, pom, pom, you know, like, yeah, you know, like, I, I think that's fine for um, drumming up enthusiasm. And I welcome, um, fa you know, fan fanning that. But I also believe that Black creators are just like anybody else if they grew up in the West or if they grew up on this planet because of, you know, um, again, I'm persuaded by the Afro pessimists and their antecedents. Like, you know, we have also grown up seeing all of these tropes, all of these uh, marginalizations. We've grown up in this. And so um, I guess I'll close by um, my answer by saying, I um, am in the process of revising my novel. Um, those of you um, who know me know that. And I'm nearing the end of like trying to wrestle with. So I completely rewrote it. It's a black fantasy novel set in Detroit. Um, I joke it's my Negro Fellowship of the Rings, right? So it's like a bunch of like contemporary black kids. And, you know, there's um, a, a white, you know, um, character and some other, you know, um, a Palestinian guy. And so I actually in this draft, and I'm telling you this because it's not going to be in the next one. I, one of the black girl characters, you don't know if she died or not. So immediately after I finished writing that draft in September, I was on medical leave about to go into surgery. I, I often reflect back on, on my own writing, um, not just because I'm a fangirl and fandom is all about navel gazing, like we're, we go meta about our meta. I was just like, Ebony, why the hell did you do that? Why would you kill, like you just killed, like you have written, you've been complaining about black girls dying in fantasy your entire life, not even as a scholar, since you were a little girl. And now look at what you did. And then I said, you know, and then I looked at my notes or like how I felt after I finished writing that draft. And I said, you know, but the narrative, the way the narrative was set up, it flowed that way because out of that group of teens, and I was like, oh shit, like, and so, but I had already written um, notes toward a black fantastic. So uh, I already knew that um, this was a problem and it's not a problem everywhere but it's certainly a problem. And I, I, I just would hope that we would begin asking some hard questions about how to completely decolonize narrative and not just say, you know, um, it's not just the identity of the creator, although that's a huge part of it. Um, I think that we have to constantly be critical and, um, you know, teachable and malleable in, in all of these things. Um, from um, Rania um, Ibrahim. Hi, what do you say to arguments that stories, histories need to be accurate and that in darkening, rewriting characters into POC is dishonoring the original narrative? Well, um, I don't know whether or not um, that one factor of identity is um, something that renders um, a character inaccurate. Here's the, here's the thing. So I think if that question came to me and I was in one of my seminars, I would ask, okay, so let's talk about accuracy and authenticity. I, had a I have a really short um, treatise on that in the Dark Fantastic in the Merlin chapter where people argued that Guinevere um, on the show was, um, in, um, you know, was inaccurate uh, or inauthentic because there would have been no black people in um, post-Roman or sub-Roman Britain. So that would have been uh, maybe the um, sixth century. Yes, yeah, sixth century, the uh, fifth or sixth century AD. Um, and um, yeah, so there were, um, you know, there were people who made that very argument. And so usually what we'll hear is that, what if we had a white Martin Luther King? You know, um, in a show, you know, what if in Selma, Ava DuVernay had cast, um, you know, they'll name a white actor as Martin Luther King. So there are a couple of things um, about that. So usually people don't ask questions um, about um, whitewashed Asian characters or um, Arab characters, right? So um, certainly there are so many um, instances of characters from um, the Middle East that are played by actors that are not from the Middle East um, or not from um, those cultures at all. And the same thing is um, um, 
so prevalent when you think about, um, you know, Asian diaspora narratives. There was a hashtag created by Ellen O called whitewashed out. Um, so you see that. Um, I think that the interesting thing about Hamilton is that um, there are many different ways that you can read it. So I don't know, I don't think necessarily that Miranda himself was trying to be, you know, subversive or I'm going to decolonize, um, uh, you know, the founding of the United States. Um, I don't think that was his project. I think he read the Chernow biography of, of Alexander Hamilton and then he, you know, um, if you ever saw In the Heights, you know, he wanted to give it the In the Heights treatment, and then he casted um, the characters, not just as, for, you know, Black and Latinx and Asian folks, but he was representing um, New York, you know, like if you even, you know, the title song that everybody knows, and New York, you can be a new man, you know, like that whole part. I mean, he was representing if, you know, the music and the styling was contemporary. <laughs> He's representing contemporary New York. I don't think that and I don't, maybe, I'm sure there's somebody on the, um, here in the talk who's, who knows more or who has read, you know, knows more about his background, but I don't think that he's read what we've read. And I don't think that, you know, like, you know, his purposes for um, that were the same as, as, as ours. And so um, I do think it is very different because of the ways in which um, asymmetries of power operate. It is, it means something different when a white person takes, um, you know, or is, um, takes a POC role or Black, Indigenous people of color, you know, Latinx, um, Asian Arab role than the, than the opposite because of <coughs> power and, um, the way that power shut up. There's no shortage of roles for white actors. There just isn't. I mean, there, that just can't be argued. <laughs> Whereas the opposite is, um, <coughs> sorry, not enough water. <laughs> I'm going to drink um, a little water. I'm reading the questions and talking and oh. doing my best here, folks. Um, De Deborah Hendricks asked, what is your vision for inclusive char characters going forward? Is it in the hands of both the authors and readers? Hmm. I do think it's in both. And I thought, think it's um, in the folks that you um, uh, provide access to both. So it's everybody, it's um, authors, it's readers, it's teachers, it's librarians, it's um, parents and caregivers, it's communities, it's publishers, it's Hollywood, every, you know, all, all hands are needed on deck. So um, we have a rising generation of creatives, of scholars, of thinkers, of activists who are thinking about all of these things in such incredible ways. I mean, just um, beyond amazing. And um, I, I'm hopeful that they're given the space to do what they have to do, but um, I'm also not satisfied with the amount of marketing that um, some of our um, uh, diverse um, science fiction and fantasy and um, all diverse media gets. So, I mean, it was, um, you know, not enough people are watching Black Lightning um, as compared to Flash. I mean, it's still popular, but it's not as popular as the Flash and the fandom is only a fraction of its size. Um, I feel the same about Black Panther. If you look at the fan, um, the fan works and the size of the fandoms, you know, you have um, so much more for um, some of the other series. And of course, some people argue, you know, because people always want to argue semantics. It's like, well, Ebony, you know, there's been multiple movies for some of the other uh, characters or series, and there's only been the one for Black Panther. And it's like, okay, point taken. But um, I definitely think that readers and audiences matter, which is why I do the work um, that I do. And um, I think that um, I don't want to just put the burden on um, Black readers and fans and audiences, because again, we show up in these mainstream um, texts and stories and narratives. And um, so um, even when we steep ourselves in other kinds of stories, um, everybody is also reading about us and not necessarily reading um, our stories. I think I'll close with this. Um, on the day when I see it as 
many <laughs> uh, white kids and teens and young adults writing fan fiction, drawing fan art, and enjoying um, majority um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color BIPOC uh, -B work. Um, when I see um, uh, cis hetero kids enjoying and reading um, and watching LGBTQ uh, children's and young adult books, when I see et cetera, et cetera, when I see just as many, I think we'll have achieved a balance of stories. I don't think we're close to that yet. And I think we all have work to do and I'm excited to do that work with all of you. Okay. Well, that's been me for talking at my computer for two hours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Thomas. That was just fabulous. <laughs> and we appreciate you. Um, using your voice for such an extended period. <laughs> no, it's fun. It's just the interaction. You know, it's the everything everyone's been saying about you know the crisis, like you you know the human interaction part of yes. it. But it was. I'm so thankful to all of you. Um, I want to say um, Ramadan Mubarak to all of our friends um, on the call. I wish I had said that earlier or on the. Um, uh, in the program who were, um, cel you know, um, celebrating the start of um, the Holy Month and, um, you know, for, you know, all of you, I hope you have a good night. And thank you so much, USC, for having me. This was, this was a pleasure. It was a great pleasure for us as well. Um, just a bit of information for the attendees. Um, thank you all for joining us. You will receive a follow-up email with a survey, and we would value and appreciate your feedback on tonight's session very much. You'll receive an additional email with a link to the recording of tonight's session also. The recording will also be posted on the University of South Carolina's College of Information and Communications YouTube page. So that'll be available for anyone who wants to view it. Um, so on behalf of the University of South Carolina's School of Information Science and South Carolina Humanities, Thank you very much again for being with us and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. You as well. Goodbye, everyone.